well, this is the Rob. I guess this is our third like interview that we've collaborated on. We met uh, back in January and did two video interviews uh, while I was in Portland. So uh, this is our third collaborative interview, and I and I knew that we were going to continue to keep on <laughs> that we we're going to continue to do these kind of collaborations. But uh, but in this one, we are speaking with uh, Yoav Litvin and. You know, I'm really excited. I, I didn't know much about you or your work until Rob basically was raving about it and sending me all kinds of, <laughs> of your articles and links. And I think that, uh, you know, the fact that I really have to thank you, Rob, for turning me on to, uh, to Yoav's work. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I'm just super excited to kind of go over the particular dimension of, of how you analyze Zionism, um, and, uh, its conflation with, uh, anti-Semitism, um, the kind of psychology behind it, the, the neurology as well behind trauma, settler colonialism mindset that has produced the state of Israel and the apartheid regime that it sits on. Um, and and so I, I guess to maybe the first question I would ask, uh, if that's okay with, with Rob, I'll just ask a question really quick. Um, but I, I think at the very beginning, before we started the interview, we were discussing about laying out some terms because I think people get really confused, and there's a there's a very good reason for that. But people get a bit confused about what is actually anti-Semitic, what Zionism is, and why there is this um, you know wedding of these two ideas that are actually very different from one another. So you have if you could please um, explain what you understand Zionism to be, and and maybe why. The term has become, and, and the idea of Zionism itself has become confused with anti with uh, or criticism of Zionism, I should say, is being confused with anti-Semitism. Well, Zionism is a modern movement uh, which gained traction among uh, the Jewish population. It was actually uh, it began as a Christian movement, and it gained traction among the Jewish population only in the 19th century. Uh, mm mostly in areas of Eastern Europe, Russia, and then it moved on to Western Europe, uh, Germany, etc. Um, it was a secular, profoundly secular movement, um, which began as a liberation movement, but very quickly morphed into a settler colonialist movement once Palestine was selected as the objective. Mm. So that is one uh, kind of narrative that is dispelled very easily when Zionists claim that it's a liberation movement. Well, perhaps it started that way, but once Palestine was selected as an objective, that's it. It became a a settler colonialist movement. Um, It is a white supremacist movement. It was inspired by similar movements in Europe. Uh, it, It was inspired by colonialism and a, a term that's called settler colonialism, which um, refers to settlers leaving uh, their uh, their country of origin and settling in a new country with a kind of manifest destiny um, philosophy where uh, this new country is a homeland, it's the promised land, and um, there is always a problem for the settler colonialists which is there is a native population. And what do you do with the native population? You annihilate it in one uh, way or another. And you can see this throughout all the settler colonialist uh, projects, including the United States, Canada, Australia, um, New Zealand, South Africa, etc. Annihilation could be in many different forms. It could be in the form of uh, literally annihilating and killing the people. It could be a cultural annihilation. It could be apartheid, etc. So there's many forms that it can uh, um, that it can express itself as. Um, Zionism is no different. Uh, that what makes Zionism uh, confusing to some is the conflation that it has taken upon itself with Judaism, uh, which is ahistorical. Like I said. Zionism is a movement that started uh, with Christian people, not with um, with Jews. Of course, Jews will tell you that if you look back in the scriptures, you'll see that there was a coveting kind of a, 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 a desire to go back to Jerusalem. But it's very difficult to connect these uh, these um, 
phrases to the modern movement, the modern Zionist movement. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, so it's a, uh, it's, it's very much a matter of, uh, very, uh, how shall I say, um, free interpretation or liberal interpretation, not liberal in the political sense, but in the sense that, uh, you know, you have to make a lot of logical leaps uh, to, sure. to go back to Jewish scriptures and say that there's always been a kind of desire to go back to uh, what is what was Palestine at the time. Mm. So um, I think that should answer your question. Well, yeah. One, one thing I wanted to ask you, Yoav, is that you associate – Zionism, or you've talked about that there's cycles of trauma uh, that associate with, with Zionism, which obviously is leading to acts of aggression that we're seeing play out against Palestinians. Can you talk about that trauma that you associate with Zionism? Sure. Uh, well, Professor Jake uh, Yaakov Rabkin, um, who is in Quebec, if I'm not mistaken, um, a Canadian professor who's um, Orthodox Jew, has really laid out the uh, early history of uh, Zionism in Russia, which I find extremely interesting. And he talks about the Jews there who were um, secular but not emancipated, meaning that they kind of shed these uh, notions that the more Orthodox Jews had of anti-Semitism being um, some kind of divine will that they had to accept. So they were these secularized uh, Jews from Jewish origin who uh, suffered all these pogroms and acts of violence against them. But the modern uh, philosophy of, um, you know, uh, of kind of empowerment, um, they adopted as well. So they didn't accept this violence like like their predecessors uh, did. And. um like I said, they were profoundly in- influenced by nationalistic movements all over, and they uh, they decided that they would retaliate. Um, and when I talk about defense, that is a pattern of behavior that we can see in all mammals. So uh, I study defense in mice and rats, and there's a pattern of behavior that is dependent on um, uh, on uh, distance from the threat and also availability of escape. And it's interesting to look at it from this perspective, because when one has the ability to escape, one escapes. It makes sense. You'd rather just run away than actually risk um, getting hurt or even killed, especially if you're in a minority, right? Um, But when you're cornered, which is what a lot of these Jews were, who were in segregated communities, right? When you're cornered, you... um, you are either uh, forced to freeze and hope that nothing happens to you or you call, or you do something that's called defensive attack. It starts with defensive threat. And if the, the threat comes even closer, you attack that threat. And that's called defensive aggression. Now, defensive aggression can lead to um, your can lead to actually successfully warding off a threat. And then one can either go back to um, his or her own activities, uh, or uh, feel a sense of reward. Um, now, this reward, according to my my hypothesis, my idea, um, often leads to a sort of um, uh, neurological change. Okay, so now we get into from the defensive circuitry, we get into more of the reward pathway. And what the reward pathway does is it it reinforces a cycle. So now it reinforces a cycle where aggression is rewarded. And I when I when I talk about this with people, I give the example of, you know, when I was a kid in school, I was kind of short and I was a little weird because I grew up in the U.S. and then I came back to Israel. And so my accent was funny. So, you know, I got picked on a little bit. And that one time when I actually stood up for myself and like hit the bully, right? I felt this rush, right? So you feel this rush, like, wow, I was able to defend myself. And that rush, um, in some people, uh, can actually 
uh, encourage aggression. Okay, so what began as defensive aggression, um, which was a result of fear, is now morphing into an offensive aggression pattern. Now, offensive aggression is actually um, stimulated by something completely different, not fear. It's stimulated by something that's called resource acquisition. And resource acquisition can be, resources can be many things. It can be your own safety, so that's a resource. But it can also mean um, food, shelter, land, um, of course, and access to the opposite or the same sex or partners or whatever, um, etc. So resources can be varied and offensive aggression is within a cycle of resource acquisition. Once you get the resource, you are rewarded. And then again, there is an increasing, it encourages an increasing level of violence. So if that makes sense, um, yeah, mechanism actually works on this kind of cycle where you see that there is to sustain this kind of cycle, there's constantly increasing levels of aggression. Uh, and they, they are rewarded by the hegemony, which is a, a ruling class, which is also um, protected from potential uh, effects of this aggression, right? So it rewards aggression because it's, it's able to protect itself. However, in the society, you see constantly elevating levels of aggression. And you see this in Israeli society. And I reported on exactly such a case with, uh, with, uh, on Counterpunch and Mondo Weiss on, um, a Israeli soldier called Elor Azaria who summarily executed a incapacitated Palestinian man. And, um, this was a trial balloon to see what the Israeli public, how it would respond. And uh, eventually this man got a very weak slap on the wrist and is now pretty much an Israeli hero. Mm. So it's constantly escalating this this cycle of violence. Wow. And, and uh, Yoav, I wanted to ask, you know, you mentioned kind of the roots of Zionism and, and uh, you know, sort of the secular uh, quality of it and that it didn't have that that general attitude, which is like, oh, the anti-Semitism the Jewish people are are um, experiencing, the the pogroms, all the violence that have been has been inflicted against Jewish populations, they realize, okay, we need to empower ourselves, or we need to uh, find a way to. It, the reason why this isn't hap- the reason why this is happening to us isn't because we're cursed or because God decides it. So we have to sort of take matters into our own hands. Now, that liberation then evolved into something that became settler colonialism. And, you know, at the time that the state of Israel, from what I can understand, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but the state of Israel, when it first really became into existence, was after the Holocaust, after World War II. And to me, World War II, or at least I should say the Holocaust specifically, was like the culmination of it was like the, uh, the the horrendous crescendo to all that had been building up around Ju- the Jewish populations, around this group of people that have been um, maligned for hundreds or thousands of years. And because of the various conditions that were emerging in Europe at that time, uh, fascism rose and the Jews were seen as the scapegoat and seen as the as the vehicle for the Nazis to came, you know, gain control of the state and expand their empire, basically. And out of that came this horrendous thing called the Holocaust, right? Now, to me, it doesn't seem like a coincidence that the state of Israel would have emerged almost within a very short period of time after that event ended. Do you see that a direct connection between what happened in the Holocaust and what is now the state of Israel? Well, this connects to something that I actually was uh, going to clarify, which um, it's mm. important to remember that Zionism was very unattractive to most Jews. Mm. Um, most Jews decided to emigrate. Most Jews who, who faced the program, and this is why I initially um, initially discussed these defensive strategies, because most Jew most Jews who could escape escaped. Right? Yeah. The ones the, that that is a very uh, basic fundamental defensive strategy. If you can leave. Violence, you leave violence, right? So 
the Jews who could leave to the U.S. or to the or to the U.K. or other locations um, did it. They did not choose Zionism. Zionism seemed to most Jews like um, you know, like we look at Messianic Christianity, right? And we're like, this is this is just crazy. This kind of manifest destiny philosophy that thinks that something that is written in a book from thousands of years ago applies to today and that that we have a right over other people you know it's it's yeah. fundamentally racist and most Jews rejected it as such mm-hmm. the holocaust presented zionists with an opportunity that they they just didn't have it was kind of a a golden opportunity for them you know i'm not saying that they were cheering uh for the sure. for adolf hitler Though, uh, and I've documented this and I, I, I've written about it and others have documented the fact that Zionists uh, collaborated with fascists, with anti-Semites and still do until today because there are many joint interests. Uh, the number one joint is, interest is this vision of global apartheid, right, where the Jews are all in Israel and um and the white people are in their white countries and the black people are in their black countries, right? Mm. Um, so this this kind of notion of this fascistic notion of global apartheid is something that was always present in the Zionist movement. It's it's a it's a cornerstone of it. But um back to your question, the Holocaust presented Zionists with this unbelievable opportunity to actually fulfill their vision. Uh, beforehand, mm. it looked like it wasn't going to happen. Not a lot of Jews were were, were falling for it, um, and many Jews were very critical of um, of Zionism. And 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 I reviewed a book written by um, Moses Menuhin, who's the father of the violinist Yudi Menuhin as well, uh, same last name, and 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 it's a very anti-Zionist family. Uh, and who pretty much spoke in very clear, uncertain terms about the injustice that was going on in Palestine very early on, way before the state of Israel. So the Holocaust uh, just kind of uh, made the opportunity happen for uh, Jews who, for example, my grandfather was escaping uh, the Nazis and the only place he could go was Palestine. It wasn't that he had a choice. Uh, so he went there because otherwise he, he would have been killed. Uh, he wasn't a Zionist. He, he just wanted to live his life, you know. Um, and I think most pe- most Jews uh, who was the Nazis were like that. They weren't this kind of fervent you know, like the like the early Zionists who came to Palestine were very idealistic. Most of the Jews who came in during a World War II were were just trying to get away. Um, so, yeah. So the Holocaust was kind of a, and also a huge propaganda uh, boost to the Zionist project, right? Because yeah. here. We need a Jewish state. They're killing us everywhere else. We need somewhere we could be safe, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, a question I had is you, you've you talked about this as well, and I'm wondering how is this successful? Is this fusion of self and nation with Zionism, especially because a lot of Jews initially rejected Zionism? How has that been successful, the fusion of Zionism, Zionism with nation and self? Yeah, that's uh, that's um, you know the 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 extremely successful. I'd even claim probably one of the most, if not the most, successful state propaganda effort in 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 his modern history, at least. Um, well, it starts very young. Okay, so um, you have to start from a very very early age, and um, you have to go against the truth pretty much. Right, propaganda is is the antithesis of truth. It's, um, it's it's a revisionist kind of version of history, and you present uh, you present it from a very early age. Then you make um, the entire population an accomplice to the crime, uh, and this you do by uh, just the obligatory military service, 
right? Everybody is part of the crime. Doesn't matter if you were serving coffee in Tel Aviv to your commander, you were still some screw in the big machine, okay? Uh, that is the Israeli military, which is oppressing. It's a, it's a, it's a force which oppresses another people. Um, then you use fear, constant fear, constantly. And this is I, I have two kind of uh, charts that I used in the in a talk I gave. One is this cycle that I talked um, in your previous question, which is the transition from defense to offense. And the other one is just the fear reinstatement cycle. Right. You take a population that's already traumatized and you constantly reinstate the fear. They're constantly coming to kill us. They, 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 they want the second Holocaust is they, they want to slaughter us all. They want to erase us, et cetera, et cetera. If every if you look back at the history of Israel, there was always an existential threat. OK. Mm -hmm. And now now, for example, it's Iran. Right. It doesn't matter that the evidence is contrary to what. Uh, Netanyahu keeps keeps hammering about, you know, keeps talking about in the UN, etc. And people are ridiculing him because it's, you know, he takes one statement from uh, Ahmadinejad, you know, and twists the word. It kind of reminds me of the of the smear campaign against Ilhan Omar. But um, he twists the words and 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 he uses that to claim that Iran is going to listen. How absurd it is! Iran is going to enrich uranium create a bomb and then launch it to Israel. I mean, you have to you have to be so uh completely out of your mind to do something like that because 3 seconds later there's no Iran. <laughs> you know? So, yeah. I mean, and and for what? I mean, there's there yeah. absolutely what's the it it just doesn't make any sense, but it doesn't matter. As long as you keep fear-mongering, you have the the population by the balls, so to speak. Well, I just want to say something about that, which I think there is kind of this racist or something like that quality to to the assumption that yes, it is insane what you're saying. It is insane that the Iranians would launch a nuclear weapon at the state of Israel because, again, within three, like you said, three seconds there would be no more Iran. But that I, I think many people actually think. The Iranians, the state of Iran, the Iranian people, the people of the Middle East, the enemies of Israel, right. and, and freedom and democracy and all that, whatever else you want to throw in there. But the, the enemy is that they are so irrational, they're such savages, that they're willing to destroy themselves and kill everybody in Iran and everybody surrounding them because they hate the Jewish nation so much. Right. Like That right. to me almost feels like, yes, it's absurd, but yeah. people actually buy into that narrative. And that, to me, kind of ties into the the kind of, as you say, it's a white, white supremacist ideology to begin with, this idea that, you know, the Jewish people need their own state because the world is dangerous out there and they're going to come and get us. And, and that trauma is well, I, I think there's a history to, obviously, Jewish people being persecuted. Obviously, the Holocaust happened. We don't need to, we don't need to look at history very, in, very far into history to see that happening, but... Right. But for the state of Israel to act in the way that it has and what it has built its state upon, which is other people's land, which is c continuously being appropriated by the state of Israel as we speak, that doesn't justify it either. You know what I mean? So anyway, I just wanted to kind of speak on that narrative, which is inherently racist, <laughs> that Middle Eastern nations and, and nation states would be so suicidal as to launch a nuclear weapon at the state of Israel. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say. I think that's an excellent point. Um, and just to add to that point, it's racist and it's so narcissistic, right? Mm. I mean, hello, the Ir Iran doesn't have anything else on its agenda. There's no like society <laughs> in Iran. There's no history. That's all they think about is you. I mean, there's something profoundly like mentally disturbed about, you know, nar there's, there's like some kind of um, national uh, personality disorder. You know, I call it a, a, a kind of a, a post-traumatic stress disorder that that is being constantly reinstated. You know, but the, but the um, the leaders, there's something so profoundly wrong with with that train of thought. So I definitely agree with you that it's also extremely racist and orientalist and whatever you 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 know and and, and white supremacist as far as 
you know, Iran is a very ancient civilization with a prof- incredible history and art and science. And, you know, the, mm-hmm. the thought that it would spend all its resources on obliterating Israel is just absurd. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the last thing I just want to, you know, to with with reference to your question, there's one more aspect that I see is that if you notice, there's constant war, and um, in Israel, it's it's not constant, but every so often it is necessary to uh, keep soci- Israeli society, and this is for Israeli society, uh, to keep it together. It's yes. a cohesive agent, really, and. I, I like to uh, give a shout out to Chris Hedges' book, uh, War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning, because he really dissects the uh, role of war in, in, um, you know, in this kind of white supremacist, settler, colonialist society, such as the United States, right? He doesn't talk specifically about Israel, but it, it's extremely applicable for Israel as well, mm. how war is a, in a society with a very fractured identity. Right. Israel has a very fractured identity. It's built on so much lies and propaganda and it tries to there is no real cohesion. It it tries to use Judaism. But, you know, the Judaism of the Yemenite Jews and the Judaism of the Ashkenazi or, you know, uh, the the Polish, German, etc. Jews is is so different. And Mm -hmm. war is really war and fear is are two of the agents that are just the, the, the cohesive elements in the society. So that's kind of the fourth element, I would say, of how Israel actually achieves this, what it achieves. It, it seems like it's very similar to what's what happens in the United States is war is what bonds people together. You know, with with Israel, it's it's Lebanon, it's Hezbollah in Lebanon, it's Hamas, it's Palestinians, it's Syria and Iran. I mean, it's always something just like in the United States. Um, But I want to get back to what you said about the tactic that it seems that there's so there's such success in using to distract people or to to rebut any critiques that are going on, which is this defensive aggression. Is that the common tactic that you see employed to try to, I would say, you know, just move away from what some of the policies are being implemented in Israel? Um, you're going to have to clarify that question for me. I wasn't really... Uh, um... like, like, for instance, I'll give you an example. Um, this latest thing with Ilhan Omar, where she just gives a critique to AIPAC, and then all of a sudden now she's anti-Semitic. That, that, that's being used as a defensive aggression towards her because it distracts what actually Israel is doing to people like the Palestinians or things they say against Iran, that sort of thing? Well, I mean, I don't know how uh, Ilhan Omar really applies to uh, that model as far as that model I specifically put together to explain how uh, people who uh, retaliate towards their abusers actually become the abusers, right? How the abused become abusers. What's going on with Ilan Omar is that she comes from a, she, she has an intersectional identity, which is uh, a black woman, black Muslim woman, um, which uh, affords her a very expansive view on the white supremacist patriarchy and uh, its different forms of oppression. And that is a big threat for Zionists because uh, truth is a threat for Zionists. And, um, and, and the fact that this struggle is a kind of a, um, a struggle that can bring together many victims of white supremacy, that is something that uh, Zionists are, are afraid of, right? Zionists don't want a global effort against Israeli apartheid like there was against South Africa. Zionists want the uh, state of Israel and the situation with the Palestinians to be constantly exceptionalized. It's an exceptional situation. It's not like anything else. That's what they want. Ilan Omar sees it as it is. It sees the lie of this um, conflation between Judaism and 
Zionism and says, hey, wait a minute, I can critique Israel. I can critique Zionist policy, that is, policies of expansion and apartheid. That doesn't make me anti-Semitic. However, Israel works extra hours to constantly conflate, and I'm, I'm, I, I can't stress this enough, this is the number one propaganda ploy of uh, the Israeli government and, and, and Zionism from its beginning, is to conflate Judaism with Zionism. If you criticize Israel and Zionism, it means you're anti-Semitic. That's the rationale. And Ilhan Omar, uh, you can see it like yeah, as a case study. I mean, it's just it's it's, it's clear when you, when you know what to look for, you could see how what she said was totally not anti-Semitic. She called out uh, APAC and she said something that many others have said before her who were not criticized, including people writing for the New York Times, you know. But the fact that she is a black Muslim woman makes her a target for forces, uh, for white supremacist uh, forces like Zionism. That is, uh, you know, as clear. And, and you can see that when you go uh, when you go a little bit back in our in our timeline and you can see other targets of Zionism, including Angela Davis, Mark Lamont Hill are all black people who understand this intersectional approach. Yeah, it's I, I, I can totally see how she as an intersectional um, person who is in uh, a woman that has an inter- intersectional identity. She is a representative in the Amer- in Congress in the United States. Uh, she has this platform, and you know what's so this was what so was so fascinating and disturbing about seeing what happened to her and what is continuously happening, still happening. I think. Um, she merely pointed, like you said, she merely stated something that was really obvious to almost everybody. Uh, you know, the Israeli government uh, funds this uh, lobbyist group, this group, APAC. They spend a lot of money to influence uh, American policy. They they spend, they directly give money to basically, if not directly, then almost as directly as you can, to uh, political campaigns and politicians and influence how policy is, you know, the direction of policy in the United States. Uh, and we talk about, um, you know, nations that influence American politics. And everybody is so fixated on the Russia connection, which is interesting. Um, and I'm not saying there isn't one if there is, but it's like we're talking about the state of Israel that is, I don't know how many millions of dollars they pump into uh, lobbying to influence American politicians on both sides. This isn't a partisan issue. This is bipartisan. This is something we see the Democratic Party do just as much as the Republican Party. And when she stands up and says, hey, you know, it's all about the Benjamins, baby. <laughs> People are like, oh, whoa, you can't. No, that's a taboo. You cannot talk about that. You cannot talk about that. And as soon as anybody even touches that issue, even comes close to addressing how corrupt it all is and what role the state of Israel plays in all this, then they then they say, oh, it's anti-Semitic. This is an incredibly problematic language that she is using. And we as the Democratic Party do not stand behind this. And it's always it's just disgusting. And especially considering I feel like, yeah, she has supporters. But in in Congress, I saw very few people even say anything or even stand up to, uh, for her. And I think that that's the real power that I see is that people are, are so afraid that the the issue of Zionism and anti-Semitism has been so conflated, they're so they're they're almost the same thing oftentimes in mainstream discourse, and mm-hmm. or or it's treated as a, a criticism of Zionism. I should say I don't want to say Zionism itself, but criticism of the state of Israel, criticism of Zionism is viewed as anti-Semitic, and for one person to just state the obvious and to be the person she is, I felt like I had a lot of feeling for that. You know, it was it was like. Saying the obvious now is almost impossible. So I would ask you, Yoav, how how has Israel got to this point? I know that's a big question, but like it's huge, right? I mean, it's it's a huge part of the issue. Is like how did this one nation become so deeply embedded within how policy is enacted in the United States and what is what is even considered proper discourse? within the political sphere in the United States? I, I don't know if you can even answer that question, but it's just a, a thought to throw out to you. Sure, sure. Well, first of all, just a minor correction. I mean, you can't say that uh, the Israeli government funds APAC. Okay. 
Uh, yeah, yeah. I have, apologize. You have to uh, separate between Zionists and Israeli government, right? Oh, okay, okay. Because uh, there are Zionists in the U.S. and American Zionist organizations, etc. So that's just a minor kind of point. Thank um, you for pointing that out. Sure. There's, there's, okay. There's a big uh, problem. Some people have uh, with um, understanding that it's not that this is kind of Zionist money that is now affecting U.S. policy, and that's why the U.S. is so pro-Israel, right? That falls into a trap, and mm. uh, the state of Israel and Zionists uh, in the U.S. are very happy to pick up on that and start uh, pointing fingers and saying anti-Semitism, and in a way, they have a point, because that's not what's really going on. Uh, what's going on is the U.S. is V with a capital T empire. Okay, mm-hmm. the U.S. is unparalleled in its power, money, etc. It is the benefactor. It is the, the 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 you know the the Israel is the little protege. Israel serves the needs of empire. Once it stops serving the the needs of empire. It will cease receiving all these gifts and benefits, etc. That is an important point to remember. Mm-hmm. However, it does uh, uh, work above and beyond to uh, to be a lackey of empire, pretty much. And what does empire mean? Empire means capitalism, and empire means white supremacy, and empire means settler colonialism, and empire means suppressing and combating any force that threatens these principles and Israel is extremely has served and is serving extremely well is serving the U S extremely well in its own interests. So it's really important to remember that. And and if we go back to Arab nationalism and that how Israel served the U S interests by crushing it in 1967, um, because Arab nationalism was a big threat, just like they wanted to nationalize the oil reserves, right? Just like uh, we saw in Venezuela. Why is Venezuela, why was Chavez, you know, villainized so much? Because he said, hey, get out of here. This is ours. This isn't yours. And this is what, um, this was the threat of Arab nationalism. Israel beat the primary force, Egypt, uh, of Arab nationalism. So, it served, and that's exactly the precisely the, the on the day uh, when the United States was like, "Whoa, these guys are our friends." It wasn't before. It was 1967 when they realized, "Whoa, these guys are serving us to the T." So, just to uh, just to uh, kind of answer your question, Israel um, serves empire. Um, and uh, the the Israel lobby is uh, a, an imperialist lobbying force. However, even if it dis- didn't exist, um, Israel would still uh, receive support from the U.S. And that's an important point to remember because there are people who have this fantasy that if you destroy APAC, for example, uh, uh, Palestinians will be free. I mean, that's I, I think it's completely unrealistic. I I think that um, Palestinian freedom is wedded and, and freedom really of all um, victims of white supremacy and patriarchy is wedded to uh, a defeat of 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 of, of imperialism in general. Mm-hmm. So navigating through some of the stuff that you've written, I've listened to your talks, read your work so people could understand this is when you say that Zionism is part of white supremacy, and I'm just breaking this down to kind of some individuals involved in this, is Zionism is part of white supremacy. You have Donald Trump, who is, is you know, friends with Netanyahu, Sheldon Adelson is one of his biggest supporters, yet Trump dog whistles to, to sects of people that are anti-Semitic. That this is, this is about shared interests, Right? Mm-hmm. Is that yes. is that that what you're getting at? Definitely, definitely. I mean, the, uh, you know, 
if you look if you look in the past, it's not that distant. Um, the state of Israel and uh, actually targeted uh, synagogues, etc., in Arab countries to foment uh, aliyah of these. Aliyah means uh, immigration of uh, Jews to Israel. So there is a joint interest, like I said before, of this vision of global apartheid where Jews belong, quote unquote, in Israel. It is an anti-Semitic notion because uh, it, you know, it, it, it wants to segregate. It wants to get rid of all the Jews and segregate them in this one in this one location. Um, so there are definitely shared interests between white supremacists who uh, scapegoat and villainize uh, immigrants and black people and LGBTQI, etc., and Jews and Muslims, of course, um, and Zionists. I mean, and you can see this clear as day, not only that they, they, they you know, I, I, I present uh, Avi Gabay, the first thing who was, who was, who was uh, the opposition leader um, in Israel, and the first thing that he said, and he wasn't alone in saying this, but I, I just like to uh, make a point of him because he was the quote-unquote opposition leader and not in the co- in Netanyahu's coalition. The first thing that he said after the massacre in Pittsburgh was, this just shows you that all the Jews need to come to Israel. He didn't say we're with the, with the Jewish community in Pittsburgh, we feel their pain, um, we sh- we believe that we should strengthen their presence in Pittsburgh and support them. He said they should come here, right? And and this just shows you that th- th- there's a mutual interest, uh, which is really profoundly anti-Semitic, uh, between somebody like Trump who can who can say that there are good people on the neo-Nazi right, uh, and and constantly dog whistle to them, and um, and, and and somebody like Netanyahu and any Zionist, really. I mean, if you look at the um, smear campaign waged against uh, Ilhan Omar, it was instigated by liberal Zionists at the forward, a, a liberal Zionist, quote unquote, progressive publication, American Jewish progressive publication. It was literally instigated by one of their editors. Um, and it's not by chance. Liberal Zionism is the propaganda wing of, of, of the Zionist enterprise. So now you see uh, Ilhan Omar, you know, ridiculed by, you know, fascistic Zionists who are explicitly fascistic, right? Um, Rabbi Shmuley just put out a ad in the Washington Post, I mean, villainizing Ilhan Omar, and it's just really awful stuff. But it was started by, quote unquote, progressive Zionists. So one of uh, this is kind of tangential, but one of the points that I like to stress is that there really it's necessary to implicate all of Zionism in as a racist endeavor and not focus on quote unquote right wing Zionists. Mm. Yeah, well, I want to ask, you know, I I think moving into uh, we have a presidential election cycle that's beginning. We have Bernie Sanders running again. You just recently had a piece published uh, not too back just a few days ago in truth out as of the recording of this interview uh, the title of it the Zionist smear campaign against Bernie Sanders is just beginning and you know we were discussing this a bit before the interview but you know the fact that Bernie Sanders he is Jewish he is somebody who has not consistently but much more than we have seen with pretty much every other presidential candidate we've ever had from what I can tell has stated some things about uh, the the treatment of Palestinians by the Israeli state uh, and has has been a bit more I, I almost feel hesitant at saying confrontational because that is not it at all. It's he's just a bit more blunt about what is obvious for many people around the world. Uh, and again, this taboo that I think Ilan Omar kind of broke that you've just dis- dissected. Uh, that taboo, now that that is sort of, I want to say it's, the taboo has been dispelled, but it's things are kind of up in the air a little bit more now, right? Like there was this almost quiet that nobody was supposed to talk about this. And now that it is being talked about, 
we have now a presidential election. We have someone like Bernie Sanders. What do you sense is going to happen with the – not just maybe not just with Bernie Sanders, but, but with the political discussion in general as we enter into an election uh, season, I guess, very long election season, and a bit too long, I would say. But as we enter into that kind of – that that landscape, what do you sense is going to come up? Do you sense that Bernie Sanders is going to have to deal with an onslaught of, of uh, accusations of him being anti-Semitic based on his – his criticisms of Israel. Do you think he's going to maybe become more, uh, more direct in his criticisms, or do you think he's going to back off? I mean, like, what, what, what overall do you sense is going to happen in that regard? Look, Bernie Sanders is a Zionist. Um, <laughs> uh, let's start off with that. Okay. Uh, he's a Zionist, and he's expressed this uh, very clearly uh, in an interview in Al Jazeera. If I'm not mistaken, I link to it in my article. Um, but as I said, Zionists, Zionists are insatiable. Nothing is enough. Uh, a, only a comp- complete dehumanization of Palestinians uh, uh, appeases them. And Sanders recognizes Palestinians. You know, this is what makes him, quote unquote, a revolutionary in Zionist, uh, in, 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 in their view. So my, 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 um, so, so I support Sanders' uh, critique of Israel. I think he doesn't go nearly far enough. Uh, however, compared to other candidates, he is uh, the best on that regard. Not only, um, not only if you judge his uh, words and deeds, but also the people that surround him. Uh, there are some of the some uh, who are uh, outspoken. Uh, about this topic and support the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, etc. Now, I personally believe that Sanders is the only person who can actually beat Trump um, out of all the contenders. And I think actually that um, some of the contenders are running um, merely to stop Sanders. Um, I firmly believe that. Um, I believe that if he if he backs off his critique of Zionism in Israel, if he tries to appease Zionists, he's toast. Uh, I think he needs to um, align with truth and go with, uh, you know, the, the, the available information. There's enough information out there and just talk about what's going on and uh, speak truth and uh, hold strong. And just like he supported Ilhan Omar, he should continue doing that. I, I was extremely disappointed that Omar came out with a Washington Post editorial uh, reiterating her support for the two-state solution. I think that was a capitulation uh, uh, in, in a way to, to Zionists. Um, and I think she made a huge mistake for apologizing. I think um, that is exactly playing into a dynamic where um, – she apologized for truthful statements, and now uh, that apology is constantly used by Zionists to, to, to prove that she really is an anti-Semite. And not only that, uh, which she isn't, of course, and not only that, but um, she constantly is, uh, is, is tested. They constantly want her to prove that she's not an anti-Semite, and the only way to do that uh, is to show how pro-Israel she is, right, mm. in their eyes. So I think apologizing for truth is a huge error that she made, and I very much hope that uh, Bernie Sanders will not do this. There was an article that came out um, came out today in the New York Times, uh, which really uh, spoke quite deeply on um, the goings-on uh, as far as uh, anti-Semitism and how it's, it was titled How the Battle Over Israel and Anti-Semitism is Fracturing American Politics. And I think there's a lot of truth to the statement that it has a um, great potential to fracture the Democratic Party and hand uh, Bernie Sand, uh, hand Donald Trump the victory very easily. So that's why I say if uh, Bernie Sanders holds strong, I think he will be a magnet for a lot of people who are looking for clarity and change 
But if he starts weaseling and capitulating and apologizing, I think I think he's toast. So the question I'd have for you is, let's say that Bernie Sanders does hold strong and, you know, Ilhan Omar starts picking up a little bit more steam and, and momentum. What does that do for relations between the United States and Israel? Because from my memory is when Barack Obama was president at the very end, I mean, things were pretty dicey with him and Netanyahu. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's. Between Netanyahu and, and Obama, it seemed more like a personal thing. So, you know, Obama was uh, Netanyahu disrespected Obama. And it's not a coincidence that Obama is black. And again, this goes back to the white supremacist nature of Zionism. Uh, um, Netanyahu wouldn't have. I mean, this is theoretical. I can't know this for certain, but he. But I'm pretty confident in saying that he would never have done that if it were a white Democratic president. Uh, he disrespected him in the Oval Office. I mean, uh, it was uh, it was embarrassing for Obama. So I think it was a lot of a, a personal thing. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, a quote unquote special relationship between Israel and, and, and the U.S., uh, I'd get rid of it. I mean, Israel doesn't Israel is a state. And it needs to abide by international law, and it needs to provide all the people under its uh, power with equal rights. And if that harms uh, U.S.-Israel relationships, so be it. Do you see? Do you see that anti-Semitism is trending a certain way? I mean, we had this Christchurch shooting in New Zealand, and during the live stream, the shooter was talking to people about subscribing to YouTube user PewDiePie, which is one of the most popular YouTubers in the world. And he has these videos that are anti-Semitic and they had said death to all Jews and had Nazi imagery. I mean, we had the Pittsburgh shooting. Like, where do you see all this heading right now? Oh, well, there's definitely an escalation in anti-Semitism, right? Uh, that's undoubtedly, and it's recorded and it's documented and um, it's frightening. Uh, there's uh, there's an escalation in, in xenophobia and racism and misogyny and, um, and and Jews are always targeted. They will always be targeted by these forces because Jews are everywhere. Uh, so in a way, they signify uh, the very opposite of what these forces want to achieve, which is a kind of a segregated society. Um, and um, Jews are a scapegoat and they are, uh, they've historically been a scapegoat. So there's definitely a, um, an escalation in that, and uh, and we see it worldwide. We see it in uh, in the United States, of course, but also in many countries in Europe and South America. So it's extremely worrying. You know, there's a, there's definitely a rise in neo-fascism, and uh, like I just said, Israel is part of this uh, this trend. So Israel is directly affiliated with and feeding and 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 and, and um, subsidizing and you know collaborating with a lot of these forces um, but yeah this is a very scary trend and I um, many of my colleagues don't really see uh, a way to stop it in the near future I mean again even uh, somebody like Bernie Sanders uh, is uh, you know, democratic socialist, but uh, is he really a revolutionary? Can he really? Is, he's, he's an imperialist, you know. And fundamentally, he still is an imperialist. So uh, can he stop the trend or will he just postpone it by a little bit and eventually capitulate to the forces which will be stronger than him? Uh, you know, uh, it was it was the same question that we faced uh, last election cycle when we had a criminal, a war criminal, uh, Hillary Clinton versus a uh, clown, Donald Trump. And, and who do we vote for? I mean, Hillary Clinton would have sold us the same bag of lies with the same wars. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of people were fed up with it, including myself. Bernie Sanders, you know, he, he, he's, he's more appealing, no doubt. And he's been on the right side of history many occasions. So, you know, I try to be optimistic, uh, especially with something like climate change, for example, which is such a huge, mm. you know, issue. 
um, it would be a relief just to have somebody who is uh, who, who who has that on on a priority list, right? Um, so, and all these all these issues are interconnected. You know, white supremacy and climate change obviously are interconnected, right? Because the great polluters are the forces, the capitalist forces, um, and the ones who suffer from it are the for the black, the brown, uh, the people of the global south. Um, so. There's definitely a connection between all these issues and the rise of fascism, and it's uh, it's a scary time. Yeah, yeah, and I and I want to and I agree completely with your assessment of of Sanders and and just the way things are going. You know, he is an imperialist. I think it needs to be made very clear that he, yes, he he may be the more I almost hate saying this, but the the more humane imperialist. And I'm not asking people to go out and vote for him necessarily or anything like that. But but uh, I do recognize that you know when you talk about a president like Trump who doesn't even acknowledge openly, at least, that climate change is a real real existential threat to the human species at the very least, right? Won't even acknowledge that. And then you have someone like Sanders who's like, no, that's on my that's one of the big issues that I'm going to address in my campaign. I could see how uh, how important that is for people to know that they're not insane for for having someone in, in you know a political uh, position of power that acknowledges these these subjects as such you know as as actually being real and so I, I totally understand that um, but I, the, I oh yeah Rob sorry I was just gonna say who's the who's one of the if not the biggest polluter on the planet right it's the <laughs> American military. Yeah. So again, it's it, it's a connection between all these issues and imperialism. Yeah, definitely. Um, Rob, did you have any more questions? I, I think I, I don't know. How, I know that your interviews usually run about an hour for your radio show, so I don't want to go over that. But if you had any more questions before we uh, wrap it up, I just had one last question, and, and okay. I, I feel like I definitely have to ask this, just because the election is happening in Israel in, I believe it's April 9th, and there's these corruption charges that are hanging over Netanyahu's head. I mean, what what do you see plays out between the election, between the, the corruption charges? How does this, what, what happens on April 9th? Yeah, that's a great, obviously I, I don't have a crystal ball, but I, I can tell you from my experience that um, as somebody who, uh, as the Palestinians as a prior as the priority is nothing. Nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to change. If Netanyahu gets elected, we have the same. And if Benny Gantz gets elected, uh, we have the same because he's also uh, a, a war criminal and an all around despicable individual on all the reasons that Netanyahu is. He's just hasn't been in power for that long. So he hasn't been, hasn't had the chance to, to, to be as corrupt yet, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so there is not going to be any change. The Israeli political map uh, is all Zionist, except for one party. Um, but that party is extremely marginalized. And uh, Benny Gantz, for example, who's the only, um, you know, alternative, quote unquote, to Netanyahu already declared that he would not form any coalition with a party that rejects the, quote unquote, Jewish and democratic character of the state of Israel. So that party will never be in government with any of the people who have a chance to form the government. Um, so I'm, I'm not optimistic at all. I don't think Israel can change from within. Um, that's, uh, of course, one of the. Uh, top requests of Zionist propagandists in the U.S. is um, they 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 work towards uh, so that Americans don't interfere in Israeli internal politics. Right? That's it makes sense when you think about it. Hey, why should Americans interfere in Israeli decisions? It sounds like well, that's actually a decent uh, thing to ask. But when you think about it, it pretty much means leave us to our racism and our oppression and our injustice and don't tell us what to do. Um, yeah. And I really think that the only chance for peace, well, I don't, for, I'll say justice, peace is just one step towards justice, but 
Uh, the only chance for justice and equality for Palestinians is um, something that looks like an international campaign, like the BDS campaign, which uh, kind of tips over a critical tipping point of public opinion that forces the Israeli government, just like apartheid South Africa was forced by the international community in many ways, uh, to cease from its uh, oppression and racism. Yeah, I, uh, I really appreciate uh, everything that you have gone over in this discussion. I know we've covered a lot. I know that before we started, we Rob and I, well, first of all, Rob and I were talking about it before you jumped in on the conversation, but we, we had so much that we wanted to cover, and there's so many big topics and so many fine details as well within those topics to kind of expound upon. So I think we did a decent job. I hope. I hope. Uh, I hope you feel satisfied with the questions that we uh, that we asked and the topics that we brought up. I think we did a good job of, or I hope we did anyway, in kind of covering the the, the particular dimension that you bring to this subject. Because I think. If, if I if I could just recommend, I know it's 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 more of a summary uh, of your ideas, but it's uh, it's an article that I'm gonna I'm gonna put it in the description of my episode release, but it's uh, an article that you wrote for MR Online or Monthly Review Online, which is Zionism, cycles of trauma and aggression in the service of settler colonialism. I just find that particular element of your work uh, to be <clears throat> it, it's not it's not examined enough. And, and and I and I think that that's what is so incredibly insightful about your work that I think was so uh, it was a great uh, pleasure and honor to talk about it with you uh, to talk about the way trauma uh, plays out on a collective level how it has played out in geopolitics how it's played out in all of these different things and I and I find it utterly fascinating but also incredibly heartbreaking. Because I see why it's happening. You know, this isn't a matter of demonizing people. This is a matter of understanding why people are reacting to their trauma in the way that they are. And the various ideologies and various dogmas and various things that emerge out of that to kind of justify this posture that Israel and the Zionist project has taken on. Um, I think that, that yeah, your work in that regard has been incredibly valuable. So I really thank you for it. Thanks. Appreciate those uh, kind words. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess, uh, you know, Rob, I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to say, but I was just going to give people some information so they can find uh, Yoav's work. I was just going to say, Yoav, thank you so much. It's It's been an honor to talk to you. You know, I've been talking to you now online for a couple of years. So to actually get to have a conversation with you, has been fantastic. And one of the reasons I put Patrick onto your work is because something Patrick and I have talked about is a lot of our audience is, is mostly environmentally conscious, and we're trying to branch that audience out into other issues and to, to show the interconnections that you've laid out today. And, and I feel like you are one of those voices. So I, I would tell anyone that's listening to this, you know, I'm going to link – not only I will link your website, I'm going to link the talk that you gave, Zionism, Cycles of Trauma and Aggression in the Service of Settler Colonialism. And, and just to say the, the uh, mentorship that you've given me in, in writing and, and, and writing out pieces and critiques, I, I greatly appreciate it. And I would just tell people that Yoav is one of the most thorough journalists you will see. I mean, his citations are numerous and any piece that you read of his – it's all documented. You can see it all for yourself. So I, I would just highly recommend people go to some of the links that Patrick and I will be providing. Thanks, Rob. I really appreciate that, and feelings mutual. Yeah. So I know there is your website, and that is yoavlitvin.com, and that is, uh, let's see, y-o-a-v-l-i-t-v-i-n.com. And you're also on Twitter. Is that Nook? It's 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 kind of, kind of a joke. It's okay. the way, it's the way George Bush uh, uh, Jr. and um, and a lot of people mispronounce the word nuclear, so I spelled <laughs> it out. It's nuclear. You <laughs> are. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people don't get that joke, but um, as a scientist, I I it really really rubs me the wrong way. When people say nuclear instead of nuclear, 
Um, so yeah, that's my Twitter handle. <laughs> yeah, so I'll say I'll say it again because I think I was laughing over what you when you said it, but it's N O O K Y E L U R. I was gonna say Nuke Yeller. Like I don't know, that's what my first uh-huh. when I read. <laughs> but yeah, you can find uh, a Yoav on Twitter there, and again, check out his website. You write regularly for uh, what I could tell is Truth Out, Al Jazeera, and plenty of other publications as well. So I'll, you know, like Rob and I said, we'll be definitely promoting your work in the description of this episode. So uh, Rob, it was great to collaborate with you again. Yep. I'm really happy to do this. And um, and yeah, Yoav, thank you so much for taking time to speak sure. with us. I, just a final word. I really like the fact that you guys are uh, collaborating on these interviews. I mean, I I, I spent three years of my life uh, documenting collaborations in street art and graffiti, and um, and just uh. uh uh, realizing how one plus one is far greater than two. So it's uh, <laughs> pretty cool that you guys are uh, doing this together. Keep doing it. Hey, well, thank you. Thank you.